The following is not for the faint-hearted. What you're about to hear are 10 men, all experts in their respective fields. Their work is foundational to many modern sciences, from anthropology to geology, philosophy to archaeology. They are all white men, and they all say the same shocking thing about black Africans and ancient Egypt. If you are a black individual, please understand there is no shame in what you are about to hear. Facts are simply that, facts. They do not care about our sentiments, biases or feelings. There is only one approach to facts, acceptance, however painful. And so, without further ado, After the thought had struck me, I made inquiries on the subject both in Colchis and in Egypt, and I found that the Colchians had a more distinct recollection of the Egyptians than the Egyptians had of them. Still, the Egyptians said that they believed the Colchians to be descended from the army of Sesostris. My own conjectures were founded first on the fact that they are black-skinned and have woolly hair, which certainly amounts to but little since several other nations are so too. But further and more specifically on the circumstance that the Colchians, the Egyptians and the Ethiopians are the only nations who have practiced circumcision from the earliest times. The Phoenicians and the Syrians of Palestine themselves confess that they learnt the custom of the Egyptians, and the Syrians who dwell about the rivers Thermodon and Parthenius, as well as their neighbours the Macronians, say that they have recently adopted it from the Colchians. Now these are the only nations who use circumcision, and it is plain that they all imitate herein the Egyptians. With respect to the Ethiopians, indeed, I cannot decide whether they learnt the practice of the Egyptians or the Egyptians of them. It is undoubtedly of very ancient date in Ethiopia. From the histories by ancient Greek geographer and historian Herodotus, often referred to as the father of history, writing circa 430 BC, in text that's translated from ancient Greek to English by professor of ancient history George Rawlinson, his brother the eminent Assyriologist Sir Henry Rawlinson and Sir John Gardner Wilkinson, circa 1860. They say also that the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians, Osiris having been the leader of the colony, and the larger part of the customs of the Egyptians are, they hold, Ethiopian, the colonists still preserving their ancient manners. For instance, the belief that their kings are gods, the very special attention which they pay to their burials and many other matters of a similar nature are Ethiopian practices while the shapes of their statues and the forms of their letters are Ethiopian. For of the two kinds of writing which the Egyptians have, that which is known as popular, demotic, is learned by everyone, while that which is called sacred is understood only by the priests of the Egyptians, who learn it from their fathers as one of the things which are not divulged. But among the Ethiopians, everyone uses these forms of letters. Furthermore, the orders of the priests they maintain have much the same position among both peoples, for all are clean who are engaged in the service of the gods, keeping themselves shaven like the Egyptian priests, and having the same dress and form of staff which is shaped like a plough and is carried by their kings, who wear high felt hats which end in a knob at the top and are circled by the serpents which they call asps and this symbol appears to carry the thought that it will be the lot of those who shall dare to attack the king to encounter death-carrying stings. Many other things are also told by them concerning their own antiquity and the colony which they sent out that became the Egyptians, but about this there is no special need of our writing anything. We must now speak about the Ethiopian writing which is called hieroglyphic among the Egyptians, in order that we may omit nothing in our discussion of their antiquities. Ancient Greek traveller, geographer and historian, 
Diodorus Siculus in Bibliotheca Historica, circa 36 BC. If we consider the distinguishing features of modern Egyptians, we find them all characterized by a sort of yellowish dusky complexion, which is neither Grecian nor Arabian. They have all a puffed visage, swollen eyes, flat noses and thick lips, in short, the exact countenance of a mulatto. I was at first tempted to attribute this to the climate, but when I visited the Sphinx, I could not help thinking the figure of that monster furnished the true solution to the enigma. When I saw its features, precisely those of a negro, I recollected the remarkable passage of Herodotus in which he says, and for my part I believe the Colchians to be a colony of Egyptians, because like them, they have black skin and frizzled hair, that is, that the ancient Egyptians were real negroes of the same species with all the natives of Africa, and though as might be expected, after mixing for so many ages with the Greeks and Romans, they have lost the intensity of their first colour, yet they still retain strong marks of their original conformation. How are we astonished when we reflect that to the race of Negroes at present our slaves and the objects of our extreme contempt, we owe our arts, sciences and even the very use of speech, and when we recollect that in the midst of those nations who call themselves the friends of liberty and humanity, the most barbarous of slaveries is justified, and that it is even a problem whether the understanding of Negroes be of the same species with that of white men. Orientalist and philosopher Constantine Francois de Chazeboeuf, also known as Count de Volney, writing in Travels Through Syria and Egypt, circa 1788. Though the Sphinx's proportions are colossal, the outline is pure and graceful. The expression of the head is mild, gracious and tranquil. The character is African, but the mouth and lips of which are thick has a softness and delicacy of execution truly admirable. It seems real life and flesh. Art must have been at a high pitch when this monument was executed. Vivant de Non French archaeologist and artist, writing in Universal Magazine, 1803. Pinkerton believes that the Egyptians are of Assyrian or Arabian origin. Heren's opinion seems more justified, that they descended from the Ethiopians who themselves, according to Diodorus of Sicily, considered Egypt one of their colonies. The more we go back into antiquity, the more resemblance we find between their respective countries. The same writing, the same manners and customs, worship of animals, which still persists in almost all Negro groups, existed among the Egyptians. Their physique was that of the Negroes, although their colour was somewhat lightened by the influence of the climate. Herodotus assures us that the Colchians were originally Egyptians because, like the Egyptians, they have black skin and frizzled hair. This testimony invalidates the reasoning of Brown, who claims Herodotus meant only that the Egyptians had a dark complexion and frizzled hair when compared to the Greeks, but that this does not indicate they are Negroes. This assertion of Brown lacks nothing except proof. The text of Herodotus is clear and precise. The Negroes were our masters in science, for in the opinion of many writers, the Egyptians, to whom Pythagoras and other Greeks travelled uh, to learn philosophy, were Negroes, whose native features were changed by their successive mixing with Greeks, Romans and Saracens. Theologian and priest Henri Gregoire, writing in On the Cultural Achievements of the Negro, 1808. Please. If you're enjoying this video, give it a thumbs up and help the algorithm bring it to a larger audience. Also consider subscribing and clicking on the notification bell for more informative content like this one. Thank you.
Before leaving Nubia, I shall take the liberty of jotting down a few observations capable of establishing the anteriority of its civilization to that of Egypt. I have reported a great number of ancient usages which have continued in Nubia but have left no traces in Egypt. We cannot, I agree, draw from this any proof that these usages were not born in Egypt. But if we are to establish that the principal objects used in the cult of the ancient Egyptians were products belonging exclusively to Ethiopia, one will be led to recognize that this cult was not created in Egypt. It is rightly said that the migrations of peoples seeking a settlement go down river. Adopting this natural trend, we could not refuse to conclude that Ethiopia was inhabited before Egypt. Thus, Ethiopia was the first to have laws, arts, writing, but these civilizing elements, still crude and imperfect, were greatly developed in Egypt, which was favored by the climate, the nature of the soil, and the geographical position. Geologist Frédéric Caillot, writing in Voyage à Meroe in 1836. The ancient Egyptians belonged to a race quite similar to the Kanu or Barabras, present inhabitants of Nubia. In the Copts of Egypt, we do not find any of the characteristic features of the ancient Egyptian population. The Copts are the result of cross-breeding with all the nations that have successively dominated Egypt. It is wrong to seek in them the principal features of the old race. We find in the tombs the Egyptians and Africans represented in the same way, which could not be otherwise. But the Namu, the Asians, and the Tamu, Europeans, present significant and curious variants. Egyptologist Jean-Francois Champollion, decipherer of the Rosetta Stone and the hieroglyphic text writing, circa 1839, in a letter to his brother Champollion Figiac. It is curious that the earliest known civilization was, we have the strongest reason to believe, a Negro civilization. The original Egyptians are inferred from the evidence of their sculptures to have been a Negro race. It was from Negroes, therefore, that the Greeks learned their first lessons in civilization, and to the records and traditions of these Negroes did the Greek philosophers resort as a treasury of mysterious wisdom legal philosopher, political economist, and British Member of Parliament, John Stuart Mill, writing in Fraser's Magazine for Town and Country in 1850 on The Negro Question. From what has been adduced, we may consider it as tolerably well proved that the Egyptians and Ethiopians were natives of the same race whose abodes from the earliest periods of history were the regions bordering on the Nile. These nations were not Negroes such as the Negroes of Guinea, though they bore some resemblance to that description of men, at least when compared with the people of Europe. This resemblance, however, did not extend to the shape of the skull, in any great degree at least, or in the majority of instances. It perhaps only depended on a complexion and physiognomy uh, similar to those of the Copts and Nubians. These races partake in a certain degree of the African countenance. In complexion, it seems probable that the race was a counterpart of the Fullers in the west of Africa. The blacker Fullers resemble in complexion the darkest people of the Nile. They are of a deep brown or mahogany color. The fairest of the Fullers are not darker than the Copts or even than some Europeans. Other instances of as great a variety may be found among the African nations within the limits of one race. From some remarks of Diodorus and Plutarch, it would appear that the birth of fair and even red-haired individuals occasionally happened in the Egyptian race. Both these writers say that Typhon was red-haired. The former adds that a few of the native Egyptians were of that appearance. The question that now presents itself is one of a singularly interesting character. Whence arose the arts and civilization of Egypt? 
Were they indigenous? Or did they come to her as the gift of another land? Everything seems to countenance the idea that civilization came gradually down the valley of the Nile, from the borders of Ethiopia to the shores of the Mediterranean. Monuments, tradition, analogies of every kind are here in accordance with natural probabilities. There was a period when the names of Ethiopia and Egypt were confounded together, when the two nations were thought to form but a single people. In all the recitals and legends of the earliest antiquity, the Egyptians are associated with the Ethiopians, and to the Ethiopian is assigned a distinguished character for wisdom, knowledge and piety, which testifies to their priority in the order of civilization. We see also the common traditions of the two nations referring to Meroe, Nubia, the origin of most of the cities of Upper Egypt, and among others of Thebes. It is to Meroe, its ancient metropolis, that Thebes attaches itself. Classicist and ancient historian Charles Anthon in a classical dictionary published in 1857. There is no so-called savage nation known under the sun which has so much distinguished itself by such examples of perfectibility and original capacity for scientific culture, and thereby attached itself so closely to the most civilized nations of the earth as the Negro. For this is learned from a comparison of the mummy skulls with the Egyptian works of art, that they distinguish three sorts of national characters which differ very decidedly from one another, of which one is most like the Abyssinians, another the Hindus, and the third the Berbers or ancient Libyans. All the monuments of the old art of the ancient Egyptians, from the statue of Memnon down to the pottery seals which are found with the mummies, show likenesses very similar and all closely resembling each other. The face is somewhat long but by no means emaciated, the nose prominent, broad towards the nostrils, and ending in a sharpish lobe, and finally the mouth small, girdled with swelling lips, all of which are most positive and unmistakable signs of the Egyptian head. The appearance of the Ethiopians is so well known that it would be superfluous to say much on that point, for although the nose in almost all human embryos is depressed, Still the Ethiopians of whom we are speaking have their noses or interstices, to use the expression of Isidore, so expanded that even setting aside the swelling lips, anyone could tell the nation from them alone. As to the racial face of the Egyptians, a careful contemplation and comparison of these monuments has easily taught me to distinguish three sorts of face amongst them. The first like the Ethiopian, the second the Indian and the third into which both of the others have by the progress of time and the effect of the specific and peculiar climate of Egypt degenerated, spongy and flaccid in appearance, with short chin and somewhat prominent eyes. Johann Frederick Blumenbach, father of anthropology, in Anthropological Treatises of Blumenbach as compiled by Thomas Ben Dyche, circa 1865. Those were your ten white scholars saying the unthinkable about black Africans in relation to ancient Egypt. The authors whose words you have been listening to ranged from the ancient era of Hellenistic supremacy down to the 19th century. Most viewed the evidence impartially, some seeing the ancient Egyptians for themselves, yet all concluded that the ancient Egyptians were a black race and or people group not tanned, not olive, not Mediterranean, but continental black Africans. Yes, these black Africans had a variety of phenotypic characteristics, if you take the opinion of the father of anthropology, Thomas Blumenbach, and the American classicist, Charles Anton. Nevertheless, all previously cited sources unanimously support the conclusion that the ancient Egyptians, before subsequent millennia of mixing and displacement, were black Africans originating from deeper within the African continent. 
You're surprised? Don't be. Simply like the video and help the truth gain back ground lost to decades of lies and misinformation. Also, don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more educational and informative videos like this one. From Kush to Compton, this has been Trill Black, no doubt.